Uh, thank you all. Good morning. Uh, as he said, my name is Dave Furfro, and I'm here to talk about the story of jQuery UI Touch Punch, um, known around the internet as Furf. Google it, and with the exception of one guy who makes dog collars, uh, every hit is pretty much going to be me. I'm a user interface engineer. I've worked with Major League Baseball, Mebo, Time Inc., and various failed startups. Uh, jQuery UI Touch Punch, for anyone here who doesn't know about it, is a small hack that I wrote that uh, patches in touch events into jQuery UI. Um, it's more than that, though. It's the story of a piece of code that was almost never written. Uh, for the life of me, I don't remember how it got written. Uh, I've never actually used it in production, and it now runs on over 60 million websites. More importantly, though, it's the story about helping others, uh, sharing your work, uh, following creative impulses wherever they may lead, lead you, uh, without regard for the consequences. And the motherfucking consequences. Meet Caleb. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little story about Caleb, but before I do, first, I have to, by law, show you this. All right. Caleb and I worked together a few years ago at Major League Baseball. We were both user interface engineers. Caleb remoted from Tennessee, and I worked in the New York offices. And one day, he was visiting our offices, and as he was, uh, this moves, uh, as he was walking through our uh, section, he mentioned that an interface he'd been working on all of a sudden was failing, but only failing on the iPad. And he wasn't quite sure exactly why or what was going on. I didn't either. I was only standing there doing my work. But on the subway home, I started to think about the problem. Why wouldn't that work? Uh, and then it came to me jQuery was written to support mouse events. And the iOS generates touch events and some mouse events. Keep in mind that jQuery UI 1.8, which was the release at the time, was released two weeks before the iPad. So before that, people really weren't thinking about whether or not, I mean, maybe they were, thinking whether or not their touch interfaces, their, their really intricate touch interfaces were working or not on mobile. Yeah. I mean, this is just an opinion, but for me, mobile didn't really take off and become real until the iPad made uh, touch environments really rich, big, usable. Oh, wait, did something just alert? Yeah, we can put stuff into your presentation Yeah, I, I, I tried to disable that, but there's no global way to disable notifications. So please be nice. This is a, st this is a talk about being nice, OK? What? This is such a fragile talk that I'm not touching anything but the space bar. <laughs> this is on you. Be good. Uh, so here's sort of the roster of mouse and touch events. Uh, you know, there are sort of two. <laughs> well, oh, you forgot your headphones at home. That's why you don't hear me saying, don't tweet at me. Why you no watch live stream? Uh, OK, uh, so you basically have movements and actions. And movements in a traditional interface are all your mouse overs, enters, moves, outs, and leaves. And when you click something, an action, uh, you get a down, up, and a click event. Over in touch land, though, when you're moving, you get touch, start, move, and end. And when you click something, you get start, move, end, over, uh, mouse over, mouse enter, mouse move, mouse down, mouse up, and click. So it doesn't seem like it's going to be easy, but it's actually easier uh, said than done. Oh, I can do that. We just need to make fingers sound like mice. And to do that, we just do a little touch to mouse conversion. Anyone who gets the reference is as old as I am on that second line there. And talk to me later about you know, urban music. Um, so to turn a touch start into a mouse uh, event, you, give it, you, you have to trigger over, move, and down to move it. Easy, one to one, mouse move. And to end it, you got to go mouse up, mouse out, and if there was no mouse move, click. OK, so that's easy enough. Uh, I went home, and I cobbled together my first, first version of this piece of code. And you'll see in here, we just have one function. That, 
the, the important one is here. Is that big enough for everyone? I noticed some of the other code was really small. So I made this big at the last minute. Stop. Uh, so <laughs> OK, all right. Is anyone here at Con from Condé Nast or worked there before? That was Rosie. Um, oh. You're up there in my Hall of Fame with Boaz now. Um, OK, <clears throat> so let's see. Translating events, uh, when we're calling our events, uh, when we're mapping them, you can see here uh, where we would normally listen to a, uh, a touch move. Actually, down here is where we're assigning our listeners. Uh, but where we would normally just trigger uh, a touch move, uh, what we're doing here is triggering a translated event. So this was just, if you received a touch, oops, sorry. Uh, if you received a touch event, it would translate to a mouse event and just sort of fire it. Uh, it, it would use jQuery's native trigger, which iterates through the item stored in jQuery's event cache, uh, which turns out to work, or at least it did for what we were doing that day. Uh, although, uh, anecdotally, once again, I spoke with Caleb uh, two days ago we, we really don't know what this was. We don't know why we did this or, or, or why I did this. So, but I remember this working. And uh, you know, before I uh, you know, got this code, uh, started to distribute the code, I, I stopped to think about how I would approach the problem uh, you know, sort of from an open source way. I could do the right thing. I could fork jQuery UI on GitHub. I could open. Uh, the code in my favorite editor, find all the mouse listeners, add analogous touch events, write corresponding tests, submit a pull request, and wait. Now, if I do that, uh, then uh, the code will make it, you know, maybe if it's functional and useful, it will make it into the actual code base, and, and the world can use it, and I can use it. But if not, and other subsequent updates come out, I now have to be careful to go back and do all this work again on the next update if I want to upgrade. Or I can duck punch. Is there anyone here who knows what a duck punch is? Quack, quack if you know what a duck punch is. Really? Cowboy? Thank you. Duck punching, AKA monkey patching, not to be confused with donkey punching. It's just a way to extend uh, runtime code in dynamic languages without having to modify the original source code. But seriously, not donkey punch. I've made that mistake. Uh, in, in another library, I apparently donkey punched the code in. And <laughs> yeah. So yeah, where is Paul Irish when you need him? Now we get to the point, how to fulfill your own feature request or duck punching with jQuery. But Paul Irish did that first. And when these slides are live, you'll be able to click that link and go to a great blog post about how to introduce your own features into jQuery or any other library with a public API using duck punching. A great quote that came out of there is, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck, right? So if this duck's not giving you the noise that you want, you just got to punch that duck until it returns what you expect. And I think that it might be a different Patrick Ewing that the quote is attributed to, but this was the only photo I found. <laughs> so who's down with AOP? Who here knows what aspect-oriented programming is? Quack if you know what AOP is. Yeah. Uh, so for those of you who don't, it's a programming approach that allows you to add hooks called advice uh, before or after object methods allowing you to make modifications, insert logging, uh, calls, uh, whatever you'd like, however you'd like to modify the code, update it for a different uh, environment. So here are some facts. Uh, very little in JavaScript is actually private. You get some privacy enclosures, uh, but if you really want to make a usable API, it has to be exposed to the public. And if it's in the public, 
that means that we can overwrite the API functions and add advice or just completely replace functionality. If you want to see a great example of an, a jQuery plugin that duck punches, uh, take a look at MockJax. It allows you to uh, override the native AJAX functionality so that you can, uh, you know, as a front end developer, you can go ahead and work while your back end developers write your services. You can work with some stubbed out code. Uh, so here's just what it looks like a basic duck punch. You have an API with uh, a method. We cache the method locally. We then override it. And then inside of our new function, we can do whatever we want before. Let's say we modify the arguments or we log. Then we can optionally execute the original using uh, the this keyword to keep it in the proper scope, do some modifications to the results, and return the results. Oops. Okay. So the rules of duck punch, because with great power comes great responsibility. No. No. Yes. Respect the original API. What do I mean there? I mean maintain the functional interface. Receive the same arguments, return the same value type. This way the people using the code before or after you will, will be able to interact with it as they expected. Hopefully nothing will, that you've done will break it for them. So back to our solution, and we can look at uh, where I cached the method locally. I grabbed the UI mouse prototype mouse init, where mouse events are normally uh, assigned. I then override it, and then inside of my override, I do something before. I, start proc uh, I set up my own touch to mouse uh, callbacks that will then be used in, uh, in the widget. And then I actually execute the original method so that everything else that happens in mouse and it happens. So now we have mouse and touch enabled. And up top, we check for touch so that we don't do this needlessly uh, where touch doesn't exist. So that was it. That was my solution. I built it and I wrote it in a couple hours and gave it to Caleb. And he never used it. I never used it. Uh, and it sat on GitHub. And that was it. So now I'd like to jump back a little bit to November 2009. I came to my first developers conference in uh, Boston, and it happened to be coincidentally jQuery conference. Actually, it's probably not a coincidence that, because I think that's how I ended up here. Um, it was my first, actually, oops. Yeah, it was my first developers conference, but it was also a weird one for me because I was more of a Yahoo user interface or YUI or UE kind of guy. I, I really liked the elegance of the style and the, uh, you know, the cleanliness of the code. You could really learn something from their code base about engineering and, and architecture. And it was very, essentially very lean. There weren't any abstractions, so it was quick. And at the time, jQuery was slow. It had a lot of abstractions, but it also did a lot more bug fixing. Um, and it wasn't until I came to this conference that I spoke with John Rezig and I watched all the talks and I realized just how much this community was doing for all of us to make it faster and, and take care of all these potholes in the IE road and in the Firefox street and WebKit Avenue. You know, they were, they were patching and filling and making the ride as smooth for us as, as they could. Um, so I went in a UE guy and came out a jQuery man. Um, but one talk that stuck with me uh, in particular was by Brandon Aaron called Get Involved. Um, it was a talk about how you get started in the open source community or how you get started helping the jQuery team. Or just in, it could be involved in anything you want, uh, your community, really. I mean, the lessons are mostly applicable. Uh, first of all, just do it. Just take the leap of faith. Uh, that the world will receive you and welcome you with open arms if, you're, if you come and say, I'm here to help. You know, very few people standing in a fire are going to turn down the person with the ladder or the net or the bucket of water who's saying, I'm here to help. So to get started, if you find a bug, open a ticket. Be active so that the people who are maintaining the code can start to work on it. Or better yet, fix those bugs and then submit pull requests so that they don't have to do it, and uh, the, you know, the community grows, and the library or framework or code base grows faster. Write tests. 
Uh, I don't know where you guys stand on that. Um, you know, it, it, whether your company is going to allow you the time to write tests. But unfortunately, if you're writing into a code base that's huge, you got to write the tests to go along with any fix you make. So write them so that the people you're helping out don't have to do work. That was the point of helping. And publish original work. Don't be afraid to put your code out there in the world. There are always going to be critics, no matter what you do. Just ignore them and keep moving forward. Uh, there are going to be people you can learn from, and there are going to be people who are just opening their mouth to make noise. And you're going to learn the difference very quickly. But get it out there, because you never know who you'll inspire with what you're doing and who you're going to help. About 15 minutes later into his talk, uh, I tweeted, I'm getting involved. And I just posted a link to my GitHub account, which uh, didn't have much in it at the time. Uh, but it was my way of saying I'm here. And because I was jazzed, I was pumped. It was 9.01 AM. I was probably really caffeinated uh, and, and totally psyched. But then two days later, I submitted my first jQuery plugin. It was uh, called uh, Deep. It was for getting and setting uh, deeply nested properties without having to do something like object.deeply and object.deeply nested and object.deeply nested value in order to prevent breakage when you hit an undefined along the way. And it wasn't much. And I don't think anyone ever used it, uh, at least not outside of uh, Major League Baseball. Um, I use it a lot. I love it. Uh, when you're working with big APIs that have deeply nested hierarchical uh, you know, JSON files, this is going to uh, help you uh, tremendously, save you a lot of keystrokes. And then I found my first bug later that night, and, and I fixed it. So now I was publishing code, I was fixing, I was telling the world, oh, speaking of bugs, I want to go forward in time to November 2011. Apparently, there were 11 bugs logged against TouchPunch. At this point, I've still never used a library. And I haven't advertised it. I haven't marketed it. So who's logging bugs? You know, I, Caleb, I, I, thought, I did think Caleb was using it. But I didn't think 10 other people were using it. But I started to do the math. If 11 people are filing issues on GitHub, that means that probably 11,000 people are wondering where to file issues. And if that, then there's probably 11 million people who don't even know they have these issues. And if you follow my logic, that means there were 11 billion people using jQuery UI Touch Punch. <laughs> 11 billion people. So I Googled Touch Punch to try and figure out who's using this. And I learned a couple things. I learned that Touch Punch was being discussed on Stack Overflow as one of the de facto fixes. So I, guess, I don't know, can you say one of the de facto? Or is, that, is that wrong? I'm going to call it the de facto fix for the missing touch events in jQuery UI. Um, there were a lot of articles of people uh, asking what happened to Touch, how do I get this to work? And a lot of the comments said, try this, try that. Uh, and a lot of them said touch punch, and then there, were some, there are some other libraries that just enable touch in general, which is probably a better way to go at this point. Um, but then I realized in reading the comments that even my issues got issues. Because here we have someone says, you may ri uh, it wasn't working, apparently, and someone said, you may rise an issue on GitHub to discuss with the plugin author, to which somebody else replied, I have raised issue there, and lots other user did too, but the authors seem to be not replying, frowny. So now, the work that I had done in my living room was making someone frown, probably affecting their learning curve there. It wasn't helping their English for sure. <laughs> so I immediately realized, my name is Furf. I got to protect that name. I can't let it be dragged through the streets of Stack Overflow and, and just torn apart after I've built up this reputation as Furf the person who you just met. Um, but at the time, I was just about to move in with my girlfriend. We were a couple weeks away. There was lots to do, lots of packing. And I just said, baby, put it on hold. This weekend, I'm fixing bugs. <laughs> but I did it anyway. I hunkered down. I started hacking. I got three bugs knocked down in the first like, half hour. And then on the fourth one, it hit me. 
And I don't know where it hit me from, because I, I, I really don't remember much of this story. A lot of this is made up. Um, but I, I don't remember what caused this moment of inspiration. But has anyone here call, heard of simulated events? Quack if you have. Uh, that's five ducks, and there are more ducks in here. So simulated events are pretty, uh, uh, the five of you ducks who are here, I mean, would you agree this is sort of some fringe JavaScript? I mean, this isn't something you need to do very often. You don't need to pretend that an event happened. You're, you want to know what the user did, not what you did, because you knew that. Um, but what it is, is it's basically a way to tell the browser uh, that an event of your choosing occurred, and you can configure it how you would like. Um, this is different than how jQuery trigger works, because jQuery trigger is only capable of calling back things that were assigned in an on or a bind, or a one. Um, this will actually trigger anything, no matter where it was. Whether if, you, if you've got MooTools on the page too, prototype, you know, put as many libraries as, on the page as you want, set up as many lists as you want, simulated events are gonna knock them down for you. So, for a quick tech break out here, this is how you do it. Document create event, event init mouse event, element dispatch event. Pretty easy, one, two, three. Creating an event returns the event of a specific type. There are a few types, UI events, mouse events, mutation events, dot, dot, dot. In our case, we're worried about mouse events. So, there's init one, ooh. ooh. Typo. <clears throat> Yikes. Um, that wasn't there before, which means the rest of this slide deck might be tainted. Um, okay, so that once you have your event, you need to initialize it. And there are a lot of arguments there, but uh, once you look at what they are, they'll start to look very familiar to anyone who's ever listened to an event. Uh, things like type, uh, screen X, screen Y, uh, meta key, alt key, shift key, client X, button, related target, etc. cetera. Uh, these are things that you can define. And then you take that event that you've created and you dispatch it on the element that you want. Uh, so if you want to click a link, you would click, you would document dot, uh, get element by ID your link and dispatch event on it with the event you've created. And what that returns is whether or not the event has been prevented or rather the opposite. So not prevented. Maybe that's not clear, but in a second it will be. So if you wanted to simulate a click on an element and you wanted to write a function, event equals document create event mouse events, event init mouse event, we got click and then a whole bunch of things I'm not going to go into. Uh, you can, when this is live, you can sort through this. And then you dispatch it. Uh, the event. And if it comes back true, then the event went through. If not, it had been prevented somewhere along the line. So now going back to my solution, because this is the important part. Um, inside of our newly, completely rewritten uh, touch punch, we substitute out the triggering of jQuery events uh, or triggering of jQuery callbacks, and we're now actually simulating the actual event. Uh, so when we, anyone see touch start? There we go. So when we start, we simulate mouse event, event mouse over, mouse move and mouse down. And then what, what that's gonna do for us is, when you simulate the mouse event, we're gonna look and grab the touch array out of the original event. And we're gonna look at what events uh, what touches have changed, and those are our touches. We only need the first one because a mouse only has one. So we're going to grab the first, turn it into a mouse event of our simulated type. We're going to take our touch coordinates and configure those to be our mouse screen and client coordinates, and then we're, we're going to dispatch it on the simulated event. And the great news about that was when I changed that, all 11 bugs were fixed. Every issue just went away. This doesn't mean you can fix everything in JavaScript with simulated events, but in my case it worked. And I felt awesome. I started tracking people now to see who was coming to my site. And year over year, you can actually see that actually was a zero. And somehow, some, uh, back in April 2000, 
uh, it, spot, it jumped up. I'm, I'm assuming there was some traffic that somehow was coming around my analytics. Uh, but this has been on a pretty steep incline ever since. It's used by everyone except for Middle Africa and North Korea, even Europe. So this happened. Uh, Eurosport is apparently the ESPN or something similar of Europe, and people in Europe like car racing, specifically F1. Uh, and as it turned out, this page was hot linked to the script on my site. I noticed this when some of my servers went down because my log files had, had exceeded my disk space. So I had to go in, purge those, and then figure out how was I going to stop people all around the world from hot linking. Well, the first thing I did was I tweeted. I was respectful. I tweeted at Eurosport, and I warned them that I'd be saying hello to their users. It was 1.39. By 2.24, I'd grown pretty tired, and uh, I have very little patience, and decided, I think I'm going to put unicorns on their site. <laughs> and I did. You would think that would get a response, especially from the car racing sect. But it didn't. So I ended up hooking it up to use YQL and the Flickr APIs to randomize cat images all over their site. And an hour later, when that didn't go get their attention, I'm going to let you read that. And if anyone doesn't get the reference here, be thankful that you don't. Just know that I did something very bad. And that still wasn't good enough. And then there were Jacobs. Does anyone know who this man is? This is Jacob Nielsen, usability guru. <laughs> A uh, friend had tweeted something about the sexiest page on the internet, which is his bio photos page. <laughs> so I replaced all of the cars on the F1 page with Jacobs. And that did it. I got my apology the next morning. They copied this, the script down to their site, stopped hot linking to me. Um, but they weren't the only hot linkers. There were other people, including a whiskey company who I tried to extort for free whiskey, a bra company. I was cool with that. <laughs> so you could say, oh, Dave, you're trolling. But it's OK, because Croc did it first. Douglas Crockford had the same issue with his JSON.js. So he, put in, he found out when online booty call was hot linking to JSON2.js on his servers. So he put in an alert saying, important, remove this line from JSON.js before deployment. That's a way to get someone's attention. But this is what's in there now. And that's not so nice. You know, I mean, what they did was wrong, but now you're not messing with them. You're messing with their users. And their users are also your users, for, for all you know. So there's another way to deal with this. Be gentle. Just do a check. If the domain fits in, you know, inside of your happy white list, then let it through. If not, warn. Throw up an alert saying, this is uncool. Do not load code from servers you can't control. Second, log it, which is what I did created a hot linking script, and I stored the location and the document title in case the location was an IP address. I could try and uh, reverse social engineer the, you know, the culprit uh, out of their title, and then return false. Don't let them use it. And their site will fail, but it won't hurt the user painfully. And then this happened. In March of 2012, I heard rumblings on Twitter that uh, Touch Punch was going to be integrated into the WordPress core. I was pretty excited about that. They were going to be putting it in so that the touch interfaces in their admin would be functional on iPads and other iOS devices. And then on May 3rd, the, it landed, and they used the word fantastic to describe me. I couldn't be, well, or my code, but I couldn't be more happy. You know, this thing that I'd written that at this point I still hadn't used was now being used, and it was fantastic. It was helping so many people. Like, a lot of people were, well, I assume they weren't all using iPads, but any one of these 67 million websites have owners that could potentially be using an iPad uh, to, uh, to manipulate and update their content, and I made their lives easier. All of a sudden, I'm going to be rich. I'm like, if there's this many people, 
oh my God, what do I, like, I got to get ready for prime time. This is like the first time, I mean, I've worked on big sites, but this is the first time my stuff was showcased. So I got pretty excited. I took the old slash EXP slash touch punch, which was on my site, which looked like this. And I turned it into all, all bootstrap and uh, all pretty. And then I got myself one of these and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be rich. No, I didn't get rich. I did get some donations um, uh, to the effect of a few hundred dollars over the past year and change, which I think is awesome. You know, it's only like 30 people, uh, but that's still, if you extrapolate my math, if 30 people are that happy using something that they would give you money, then there's probably a lot more people that are happy and just haven't figured out how to tell you. And that's fine, as long as they're happy. <laughs> but I'm telling you, don't me. No. And then finally, where are you, Michael? Michael Danes, Michael Danes. This is you, boy. Uh, finally, uh, two year, almost two years after I wrote it, I got a letter uh, from this young gentleman over here that the code was finally going to use at Major League Baseball. Caleb still had no idea what I was talking about. All right, I'm going to go forward again in time, and this has a little bit less to do with code. This is my friend Dave. Dave and I used to be improvisers together. Uh, and uh, we're very good friends. Uh, Dave is a very talented writer, a talented comedian, loves music, not a talented musician. But that doesn't stop Dave. He quit his high paying job as a copywriter in, in New York's uh, wonderful ad industry to inspire others. And here's what he did. He started something called the Acoustic Guitar Project. One guitar, one week, one song. A musician is given a guitar and a recorder, and they're given one week to create an original song with only the guitar and the recorder, no editing. When they're done, they sign the guitar, choose the next musician, pass it on, and see how far it goes. It started in New York, and I think that one is still going. He then moved it to Helsinki, where he had about 20 musicians. And, um, when it was finished, he flew to Helsinki and held a concert with uh, majority of them. He started one in Colombia. He went down to Haiti and started one there. And then he decided this could, this is catching on. People are feeling inspired. I want this to grow. He felt the goodness of the good he put out and he wanted to put out more good. See, that's the thing about being good. You know, when you get the reward back, it makes you want to do it again, and, and you do it again, and, and it snowballs, and that's how you come up with numbers, like 11 billion. Um, so, oops, no. Uh, so he started a Kickstarter so that he could put together a TV pilot, and I was all in, on board. I, anything I could do to help this guy, because I know him. I know he's driven and will take something to completion, and I know that his goal is to inspire, and he put, a, he put it all out there on the line for this. So I tweeted. Figuring, all right, I've made some money, not enough to retire uh, from, from Touch Punch, but I figure I have picked up an, about 200 followers on Twitter as a result of Touch Punch, so maybe this tweet will, will help. So I said, if, if any of my code has made your life a little easier, consider a, a good karma kick to the project. And one follower in specific that I know of, maybe more, but one specifically, click that link, uh, is a friend of mine, Henry. Uh, who I'd helped uh, over the years uh, develop as an engineer. I don't think he used touch punts, but it resonated with him and he clicked. And he went to Kickstarter and he looked through the, the, the rewards. And this is the one he chose. Can you see that? That's $1,000. Uh, the prize <clears throat> or the reward is a song written about you or someone you love. Something I did drove him to this site, and then he saw that, and he said, that's what I want. He'd always had trouble telling his mother that he loved her. He figured it would be easier if someone else did. So he donated $1,000 to the project and has a wonderful musician named Brianna Winter writing a song to his mother for him. And that 1000 was enough to get funded. So there's going to be a TV pilot. The project will continue. And it's because Henry was just super appreciative and super generous. 
And for everyone who wants to know where the next project will be, Detroit, Rock City. So here we are today at JQCon. Uh, touch events are coming. They'll be here in 1.13. I don't know when that is. Tag Scott Gonzalez uh, and ask him what the roadmap looks like. They're very busy guys, but uh, you know, they're doing hard work for you. Um, so be patient. In the meanwhile, keep using TouchPunch. There are already a lot of users. Unfortunately, there's also a lot of issues. I got 61 open issues with scary names like Android, Galaxy, Windows, and Jelly Beans. Is that like a new form of ecstasy or something? I'm, I'm 40, I, I, don't, I don't know what kids eat these days. I'm just one man with two devices. They're both iOS. I need help. In fact, I can't do any of this. I can't take your pull requests because I can't verify them. So if there's anyone out here in this room or anyone you go out and talk to on the way out of here who has a lot of devices and does this for a living, come talk to me. Maybe you can take over this project. It probably, it's probably not a lot of work. There's probably one small fix you'll make, like simulated events that will, will just change it all. Uh, but I, I don't have it. You know, you got to get pointer events in there. And uh, I don't know. But I got a lot of other things going on, and I still never use this code, which is a lie. Um, I did use it once, and, and if you want, I'll show you outside. I did use it once in a prototype, and it's pretty cool. Uh, like, I needed this thing to work on mobile, and I thought, oh, wait, I've got this library. I made it, and it's going to work for me. There is one bug I could probably fix to get you guys started. Um, it's a typo. Uh, it doesn't require me to get another device. So tomorrow, or even today, if you see anybody from the jQuery team, and you can look at their faces by going to jQuery.org slash team, uh, hug them. Hug them, thank them, do whatever you can, uh, because they do the right thing. They're, they've got an issue list, but they're constantly knocking them down, right? They are doing it the right way. They're not being ba a bad open source member like me. These are the good guys. You can also help them by joining. There's a list of heroes and friends and fans here. You can join. You can help out and make sure they can continue to have these events so people like me get to see what Portland looks like. And so people like them are allowed to dedicate half of their job to fixing these libraries that make you more productive. And in fact, you have to look over the past few years at things like Ruby on Rails, Node.js, and jQuery, and all these other open source libraries, and realize that they are the cause for the you know, uh, unprecedented boom in technology. If someone wants to prototype and build a site, there's open source that helps them get it done in a weekend. There are stories about sites that go up in a week or two that get funded for a million dollars, and it's because these people are doing the work. So help them in any way you can. Get involved. Just do it. File bugs, file issues, fix them, submit them, write the tests, publish your original work, ignore the haters, because you never know who you're going to inspire. That's it. Thanks. I have a minute 15 if anyone has any questions. Or if anyone just wants to go to, if, if you want to know where lunch is, I wasn't listening to Adam, so. American where, American? Oregon Ballroom. Oregon Ballroom. Are there any other questions? No, just hungry? All right, thank you.